You guys are about to get a real treat because today on the History Hit stage, I saw these guys were at the festival and I begged the organisers to let them come and do a session at the History Hit stage. They're history tellers and they are, every year, they get better and better. They're the most charismatic storytellers in the game, I think, uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, you're going to absolutely love them. Please let's have a big round of applause for the most energetic men in Short Valley. History tellers! In ancient times, troubadours walked the land telling stories of epic adventure. Now, they're back, but this time, they wear different hats. It's the History Tellers. hit stage an epic venue we needed an epic story something big something huge and when the when the organizers here at chalk valley said to us we want something big we said it's got to be the whole history of great britain done in an hour or less that's right entire history stonehenge to modern day all right here before your very eyes contrary to what it might look like we actually did some research. Yes, we did. So and we, we, we wrote like a notebook with all of our facts and figures we in did. it. We did. Alex, go and get the notebook. What, what, the notebook? Go and get the notebook. On my own? Go and get the notebook, man. All right, OK. See, it's a big story, English history, so we decided that it was going to be... Right. Yeah. As um, we say, it's a big story. Do you, need, do you need some help? I, wait, put it up there. Don't drop it. Right. Oh. There we go. There we go. There. Right. Now, ladies and gents, to start our story, we need to we need to give you a little bit of a warning. You see, some bits of British history, they're amazing. Battles, kings and queens, incredible stuff. But some bits are treaties and politics and people standing on tables waving bits of paper and, and that it has to be said can be described as a bit tedious so yeah, yeah don't worry though we we thought of this and we have invented something that'll stop this show from getting too um too boring here we have the history tellers painted boring warning uh, this will sound if the show starts to get a bit dull so uh, we'll be able to do that now I suppose I should probably explain it. Um, a bit of science here, I think, Mr Wisdom. <laughs> now, as everybody knows, boring particles are constantly travelling through the air. So what we thought was we would make this special device to filter out the boring. Basically, what will happen is anything too boring about British history will travel through the air into this special boring warning receptacle on the front where it will go through the patented tedium filter built inside. Now, the machine needs to be calibrated to the right level of tediousness. Right, OK, so, um, say something boring. Um, uh, right, ahem. <clears throat> the, uh, the socio-economic effects of Oliver Cromwell's warts and their effect on the Dutch tulip industry... Ah! Uh, there it goes, there we you go. see. Perfect. It went off straight away because we got too tedious. Right, so we've got our big book. We've got the boring warning. We've got about 4,000 years to cover. I say, let's do history! <laughs> right, now, we've only got a short time ab, so we need to use our timer, otherwise we'll overrun by hours. 45 minutes, we're gonna keep an eye on this. So let's get ready, let's count down from 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. There it goes. Right to the book. Right here we are. The book, and we start the book with ha ha Stonehenge. 
ancient history or old stuff. This takes us back to a site not very far from here. A site where we can look at an ancient monument being built. Oh. Hello, Sarge. Hello, lad. Do you want a hand with that? Oh, yeah, that'd be nice. Pick up an end there, give it a drag. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, moving these rocks is hard work. It is, lad. I'm it is. about all day. What? You know, take, taking rocks from Wales all the way down here, it's a bit silly. You know, it would be easier if we had a wider road to travel on. Or indeed a tunnel. Oh, yeah, it's good thinking. <laughs> Can you tell me, Sarge? Yeah. Why are we dragging all these big blocks down here? We are going to build a giant stone monument. Oh, a monument. Yeah, that's right. Now, now, now. Get on the old end of the rope. Oh, give yeah. it a pull. All right. So, here, you ready? Yeah. Uh, now, Sarge. Yes, son. Now, this, uh, this monument thing we're building. Yep. Yeah. What's it for? Well, that is a very good question, son. A very good question. You see, some think this is a, a clock governed by the stars and the planets that will measure the passage of time. Then there are others. What thinks it is a sacrificial temple, an altar to the great mighty sky gods. And then there are others still, what think it is a convenient place to go at when you're going down west for a few days <laughs> and you can pop in and buy some overpriced chutney. None of us know. All we know is we have to build. So very little happens that we know of in Britain between Stonehenge and the next few thousand years. Nothing's really recorded. So, next page in the book takes us to the Romans. The Romans, excellent. Gentlemen, now when the Romans show up in AD 43, they land on the south coast and plough in land. Of course, at first of all, the rebellious Celts in the area, they do not like it. But eventually, the Romans start to establish themselves. But uh, the Romans are a remarkable part of our island story. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let us introduce to you our Roman centurion, Lucius. With Roman army comes Roman civilization, And with that, all sorts of things never seen before on these shores. Many of you might ask, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, we can tell you. Let's see what's available in the sale of the Centurion. Our Centurion Lucius has got a bag of Roman tricks here today. Let's see what Roman goodies he's brought with him. It's an onion. Yes, an onion. If he was a gladiator, he'd be glad he brought it with him because these are a great muscle relaxant and suitable for use after a bout in the arena. The Romans can be planted all the way across Europe by the numbers of wild onion and garlic found across their marching route. So what else has Lucius got in that bag of tricks? It's a bottle of wine. Well, of course, the Romans bring grapes to this country, and uh, the Celts don't know anything about it, being familiar only with beer. And uh, you can have little drinkies while you're putting down the druids. <laughs> what else has Lucius got? It is, of course, lead. Yes, with this new lead, you can make a fantastic Roman plumbing and have yourself a hot bath to wash away all those blues that were fighting against the Celtic hordes. And of course, here's a brick. Now, the Celts are building everything out of wood and mud, but now with these bricks, you can build Roman roads and have yourself comfortable underfoot all the way from Watling Street right up to Ebarkham or York, as you savages might call it. And what else has Lucius got in his bag of Roman tricks? It is an elephant. An elephant? Alex, it's an elephant. Yeah, an elephant. Why have you got an elephant? It's an elephant at the road. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Cut, 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 cut. Sorry. An elephant. Yeah, an elephant like Emperor Claudius rode through the streets of Colchester. He's not wrong. In AD 43, when the Romans came to Britannia, Colchester was the capital of, of Celtic Britain. Now, as a big example of soft power, Emperor Claudius, Claudius the God, rode through what is now Colchester High Street on an elephant. And the Celts, having never seen anything like it, were blown away. 
So all these wonderful things exist for the Romans to enjoy their Roman peace. That's right. In fact, most of the Celts pretty quickly bowed down to the new Roman rulers, and that was all pretty good. However, there were some Celts who were less keen on this new form of power, and they decided they would revolt against Roman rule. I am Boudicca! Um, abs, abs, what? abs. Why have you got masking tape on your face? War paint, isn't it? Like Mel Gibson in Braveheart. Freedom! Right, okay. I thought it looked rather good. All right. I am Queen Boudicca. I will rebel against these uh, Romans. We, with our Celtic hordes, we will rise up. We will burn their town of Colchester. We will burn their town of Londinium. And we'll have a go at St Albans as well. But ultimately, we will be vanquished by their legions. And it all goes rather badly wrong for me in AD 60. <laughs> oh well. So Boudicca's revolt is eventually put down, and after that, things are plain sailing for the Romans. Us Brits here, well, it's nothing but onions, wine and elephants for a few hundred years before trouble back at home in Rome means that the legions are pulled back and we here in Britain are pretty much left to fend for ourselves for a while. So let's turn the page and see what happens next. Next we have... Oh. Hang on. Abs, the book's broken. It's, um, it's not refreshing or something. What? Girasse wetter. Hunna wetter. Hunter wetter nutter. Hunter osso wetter rasa. Hunter when arketter wetter. Hunna wetter wetter what? Uh, what are you doing? I am speaking the words of the Anglo-Saxon poet. This is Old English. Oh, no, 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 you can barely speak modern English. Is that really Old English? No. No. I'm making it up. But yeah, all right, okay. I am making it up to demonstrate that at this period, the Dark Ages, oh, we right. don't know much about what goes on. And all history is told with the poet's song in the mead halls, you see. Does the whole Dark Ages sound like what you were singing there? Yeah, mostly, yeah. That sounds rubbish. Well, it is a very interesting time in our history. Really? For example, the Anglo-Saxon period gives us wonderful architecture. It is the beginning of architecture in these lands. Why, churches like Woodford Green in Essex made from timbers, wonderful anglo ah! Boring. It's not boring. It is boring. All right then, all right then. Uh, the beginnings of writing, wonderful manuscripts in the later period where you get beautifully illuminated writings like the... Ah! Boring. All right then, all right. What about the language? Wonderful words that we have. Words that give such meaning to them. It is wonderful words. Ah! Boring! Yes, words like boring, an Anglo-Saxon word, right, actually. I'll give you that one, okay, fine. So there's nothing written down during the Dark Ages, so there's probably not a lot we could do with our book, is there? I think it's time for the next page, really. Right, let's see. Ah! That's better. The a most battle. famous his battle in English history, the Battle of Hastings. Now, in the year 1066, English kings were like buses. You wait for one and then three come along all at once. First you've got the Saxon, King Harold, who's nearest, I guess, and he gets his feet under the table and he becomes the King of England. Now over in Norway you've got another Harold who thinks he should have England. And then over in what we now call France, you've got Duke William of Normandy and they all think they have a claim to the throne. Now the first fight is between the two Haralds. And they have a right old to do up north. The English Harold comes out best and his Saxon armies are victorious up at Stamford Bridge, meaning that the Norway claim is now forgotten. Well done, my brave boys. You have won a famous victory here today against Norwegian King Harold Hardrada. We have given him six feet of English earth. That is the only land of ours he shall have. But... I've just received news that those pesky Normans have arrived down at Pevensey Bay in the south. So, I know you're tired, men, but 
but you must make your way down south to fight against the Normans. Yes, we're down here on the south coast having landed in our boats and we're ready to fight. Disappointingly, no matter how strong our army, the Saxons have gained the high ground. They've got the defensive position. It's gonna make this battle very tough for us to win. Here on Senlac Hill, my shield wall is strong. Providing my shield wall stays in one place, we cannot lose. Here they come. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, this isn't good. Uh, come on, men, into the fight. Oh, oh, ah. uh. That's it, come boys. On. Stay in one position, we cannot lose. Right, come on, another charge! And, ow. Oh no, right, this isn't working. We need a plan. Let me, I've got it. Oh, those Saxons are far too tough. Come on, Normans, run away! Oh, look, their Normans is running away. The king of uh, yeah, the Saxons would be really happy if we chase them. No, no, my boys, stay where you are. Keep the line strong! We'll chase them for you, King! Uh, oh. Ah, that's one in the eye for old Harold! Yes, we've won! Us Normans have won the battle, and therefore, the whole country! England is now under Norman rule! William has conquered! We are now going from the Dark Ages into what we might call... The Medieval the Period! So let's turn the page and see what else we've got. Ah, part five, medieval stuff. And, uh, oh no, Abs, it's all looking a bit dull to me. Oh, that's very important, the Magna Carta of the year 1215. You see, the way the country now works, you've got the king at the top, then you've got the lords and the barons, and it filters down through what's called the feudal system. And then right at the bottom are you and me. Well, maybe not you, I've seen a lot of Bentleys in the car park, but you know what I mean, you know. Most of it is just low-class people at the bottom. Ah! What? It's all taking a lot of time and it's all very boring. No, 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 it is very important, the Magna Carta. Oh, it uh, yes, it is important. It means that the king is accountable, but he just goes back on his word. I know. And he that's, just that's it ignores something it. something to remember, though, because... If kings go back on their word, it shows they can't be trusted. And as the book goes on, Magna Carta will come back again and again and again. It is important to remember, not even kings are above the law. What else has the medieval period got for us then? Well, we've got a list of uh, medieval kings. We've got William, then we've got William, then we've got Henry, then we've got Stephen, then we've got Henry again, then we've got Richard, then we've got John, then we've got another Henry, then we've got Edward, another Edward, another Edward, then we've got Richard, and then yet again we've got another Henry. Blimey, they need some new names, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they really do. Look, look, it is quite tedious, I have to say. A long list of people, mainly with the same name. Let's move on. Right, let's move on, away from all those kings, into, uh, ah, yeah. the Black Death. Yeah. Now, um, when I learnt about the Black Death at school, it seemed completely inconceivable that an illness could lay the entire world down <laughs> in such dramatic fashion. But it's got to be said, I sort of get it now. Yeah. <laughs> The Black Death arrives in England via ships in Weymouth. It is carried via rats, and the rats and the fleas thereon bite the people and infect their blood. Historians argue about how many people perish. Some say it could be as many as 60% of the people in Britain die in the Black Death. It's all quite grim, but what we have to remember is that after this, Britain is never quite the same place again. I think it's a bit too grim. Let's move on. Yeah. Hopefully something exciting. Yeah, we need something exciting to, to raise the pace. What have we got? Oh, it's a battle. We love That's a good better, battle a again. Battle, yes. Yeah, the Battle of Agincourt. Now, this is at the end of the 100 Years War in the year 1415. King Henry V of England. Big cheer. Yeah. Let's try that again. King Henry V of England. Yeah much better. He has decided that he will take the throne of France, that he has a legal claim. And he mounts the biggest invasion fleet the world had yet seen to go to France and claim the throne. 
Now, Agincourt has rather been caught up in its own myth a little bit, helped no end by that Shakespeare bloke who would write about it a little while after the event. But there's no doubt that Agincourt was an important time in our history. Uh, hello, Sarge. Hello there, lad. I brought you a cup of mead. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, it's... Uh... Lad, 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 lad. Will you stop talking? Wh why? The king, before the battle tonight, he has expressly said, this evening, the eve of battle, nobody in the English camp is to talk. Oh, right, I see. Um, but hang on, Sarge. Yes. I can't talk, but that bloke down there can stand on a cart and talk about crisps. That's not a bloke. That is the king, and he's not talking about crisps. He is making a heroic speech about St Crispin's Day. Oh, right. Shouldn't cons yeah, sort of say anything then about him. He's no. the king. All right, fair enough. Um, Sarge. Yes, sir. I've got a few questions about this battle. Yes, sir. Um, now, it's been raining quite a lot, hasn't it? It's been pouring down. And everywhere's quite muddy. Hugely muddy, son. Aren't we just going to get stuck in it as we fight the battle? No, no, because the king's very clever. You see these woods either side. He has established our battle position here in a narrow gully, you see. We are going to stay right here. And what's more, the French are going to come to us across all that mud out there. It's them that's going to be doing the hard work. All oh, right, fair enough. But if they get to us, Sarge, yes. what's to stop them just chopping us down on their horses? Ah, now, again, the king has thought this through. You see all those sharp wooden stakes we put out in front of our position? Yeah. They will stop the French getting to us, you see. So those stakes will stop the French before we have to use our swords. Oh, right, fair enough. Uh, Sarge? Yes? I've got another question. Yes? Remember all that dodgy shellfish I ate at the Battle of Harfleur? Yes, son? Do you think I've got time to nip to the toilet before the battle? I'm afraid not, son. You see that moving cloud over there? That's the French first line. Ooh. They're on their way, son. Swords up! Oh. Hey, Sarge, you know we had to stay quiet before the battle? Yes, son. Am I allowed to shout ARG during the battle? Permission granted to shout ARG. Very One, good. One, two, three. ARG! The Battle of Agincourt was the thing of myth, but a huge victory for the English. And King Henry V established himself as ruler of France as well. But it was not to be forever. England would lose France again as the years went by. So, Agincourt leads on to another page in the book. Right, we'll turn the book and we'll get on to the Tudor period. Ah, the Tudor period. Fascinating period in English history for sure. Uh, yeah, at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, the last medieval king of England, Richard III, is slain. The crown of England falls and is found beneath a bush. It's taken up by Henry Tudor, who becomes Henry VII. Henry Tudor's son becomes Henry VIII. And thus, we now have a new dynasty, the Tudor dynasty, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this, is, this is edging towards boring. It's very important if you're a monk and you lose your abbey in the dissolution of the monasteries, or actually quite important if you're one of Henry's unfortunate wives. That's quite important for them, certainly. We break with the Church of Rome. The Church of England is established. Die-hard Catholics in Spain, they don't like what's been going on, you see. No, that's right. They want to come and tell us what to do, don't they? Yep. Yeah. And I in 1588, the Spanish Armada. Ah, now I like the Spanish Armada. That's one of my favourites. Uh, in fact... I've done something special, a surprise for you, Mr. Wisdom. Have you really? Yeah, I have made a scale model of the moment the Spanish Armada was sighted at the first time in the English Channel. Good I'll go and work, get it. Alex. Very All right. impressive. I like it when he makes an effort. All right, so, so very good. Here we are. Can't a wait model to see this. of when the Spanish Armada was first sighted out in the waters around the coast of England. They were sitting out there, all those ships coming across the water, and we spotted them. Alex, what is that? This is the lizard who spotted the ships from Cornwall. Alex, Alex he's not a lizard that spotted the Armada. In the book it says, the Armada was spotted from the lizard. 
It is a geographical feature in Cornwall, not a reptile with binoculars and a rug. But uh, he's a he's a Tudor lizard. Right, so. That's the Armada done then, I suppose. I think that's the Tudors done. And nearly you done if you carry on with lizards with hats on. Shall I, um, turn, turn the page? page. Oh, right, okay. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Lizards with hats on, indeed. Right. Ah! So a few hundred years of relative peace, I suppose, but eventually we come back to those pesky kings again. Yes. You see, you remember back at the Magna Carta and kings who can't be trusted? Well, that whole thing has come round again. And once more, the king has decided he's above the law, he'll do what he likes and tell everyone what to do. In 1642, things have come to a head. King Charles's forces, the royalists, put up their standard and declare that they are ready for a fight. But Charles will have opposition in the form of his parliament, who believe that parliament is right and should go ahead. The battles will follow, will become, will come called the English Civil War. Now, first of all, at the Battle of Edge Hill. Now, the ebb and flow of the war was a bit like a tongue of war. The Royalists would win to begin with, and uh, uh, then the, the Roundheads would fight back. But soon, the Parliamentarian forces get themselves organised. And after that, well, soon all of the victories start going their way. By 1645, the king loses his yes. power at the Battle of Naseby. He becomes a prisoner. And in 1649, King Charles pays for his belief that he could do anything he liked with his head. He is executed at Whitehall. The country is run by Oliver Cromwell and the Commonwealth, no king for 11 years. But as the Cromwell soldiers begin to fall out amongst themselves, you get a power vacuum. And power vacuums are a very dangerous place to be. See, not everybody had the same idea of what they want the country to be like now that the king has gone. Some men believe that we should now all be equal. And this was particularly the cause of a group of people called the Levellers. They thought everyone was on the same level. They wanted us all to be the same. And when they found that, well, people like Cromwell's rule was not a lot different to the old king's rule, they decided that's not what they had been fighting for. Brothers and sisters, my name is William Thompson, Corporal of Horse, but now I call myself Captain William Thompson, I am a true leveller. There will be no rich men, there will be no poor men. We will all be equal, all equal under the eyes of God. We fought the Civil War for ourselves, not for those grandee parliamentarian lords in London. And thus, I and my army of renegades and irregular forces, we will be one true fighting force for you. I'm like the new Robin Hood. I will break into the tax office at Wellingborough and I, I will take the gold that those rich men have taken from you and redistribute it back. Hey, brothers, hey, sisters, take this gold. Take all of it. It's yours, brothers and sisters. Now, as parliamentarian forces, we can't have men like this making a mockery of all we fought for, he seeks to take the power we won during the civil wars. His rebellion must be put down and we will send an army to find him and his ragtag bunch and we'll stop them from making a nuisance of themselves. I will not go down without a fight. I fought this civil war for equality. They will send soldiers to hunt down me, William Thompson, but I'll fight back. Take that, you parliamentarian rotter! Bang! Ah, ah, he's fighting back, but oh, he can't hold out for long. He's pretty much on his own in this woods. We'll smoke him out. He's like a fox that must be hunted and destroyed. We can't let him stand. Come out, Thompson! I'll come out fighting! Bang! Ah, oh, well, you're surrounded, Thompson. There's no hope for you. Look, he's too dangerous to take any chances on. What I'll do is I will load my musket with not one, not two, but seven balls. That's bound to get him as he charges out of those woods. I'll wait for him to come out. Thompson, show yourself! I've got no pistols left. 
but I remember my old Ironside sword training. I'll go down with a fight for the freedom of all English men and women. Ah! Ah! Look, I've got him. He bleeds, but he's not going down. He's a tough one, this Thompson, and no mistake. Ah, uh, to make sure, I will go and beat him with my rifle. Ah, ah, oh, oh, it's horrible, the blood, the guts. Oh, it's spurting everywhere. It's making a mess. It's lucky you lot can't Alex, see this. It's horrid, Alex, it's all Alex, gruesome. Alex. Calm down. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry about him, ladies and gentlemen. He does get a bit carried away. The Civil War went on in a variety of different ways. People argued amongst themselves, but by 1660, those that needed stability in the country decided to invite the king back. But he was dead, so they had to go with his son instead. And we have the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Charles II, he was a king of excesses, but luckily by now, victorious as they were in the Civil War, you had Parliament to keep the country in check and move it on to be the 18th century country that would lead to us being a more important player on the world stage. Time for the next page. Time for the, the world book. stage. And here we go. Oh, political stuff. Uh, now, this is getting a bit dull, but it, it's all right because this is when our nation sort of comes together as one. Because England had controlled Scotland after the Civil War, England and Scotland became one. We have in 1707 the Act of Union. England and Scotland forevermore bound together as one nation, never to part. <laughs> well, that's all very well and good. What else has this period got for us, really? Well, we've got uh, ridiculous wigs that get worn. There we go. We've got, uh, we've got the expansion across the world. We've got large amounts of gin being drunk. And of course, highwaymen. Ah, highwaymen. I like highwaymen. People like Dick Turpin, wearing a mask, wearing a black cape, and riding a black horse, that chiselled, jawed, handsome anti-hero, fighting establishment. Alex, Alex, Alex. Dick Turpin, not a chiselled, jawed anti-hero. Dick Turpin was actually a horrible, smallpox scarred, nasty piece of work. And with his gang in Epping Forest, they terrorised individual people. They were nothing but robbers and brigands, horrible pieces of work. And Dick Turpin deserved everything that he got on the noose at Knavesmire Racecourse in York in 1736. Of a similar period, those golden age of pirates, all the romantic films you might see, ha -ha. they're just as nasty. Pirates and highwaymen to us, they're just the same. Horrible robbers of the ocean, I say we move on. Good thinking, let's keep going with the book. Here we are. Ah, now this is more like it. Another great battle. And not just any battle. A big one, the big one, Waterloo. Yes, this is excellent, a really good story. Napoleon Bonaparte has been master of Europe, but he's done the fatal thing of invading Russia. Never invade Russia. They say that because General Winter will come and get you. His armies were destroyed by the snows and the ice retreating back from Moscow. In the peninsula, the Duke of Wellington in Spain drives his forces from those hot hills and France itself is invaded. And in 1814, Napoleon can answer big victories no more. He is exiled to the Mediterranean island of Elba. But you can't keep Napoleon in one place. He plots, he plans, and with just 400 of his Imperial Guard, he lands on the southern coast of France. His old soldiers, now working for the new French king, flock back to their beloved leader, and Napoleon starts the 100 days that will lead to the Battle of Waterloo. We introduce you now to a great, Englishman, the Duke of Wellington! Yay! Ah, yes, what a fine day we've had here at Waterloo. Though the weather wasn't particularly kind, it has worked in our favour. 
And now, yes, I think those French are retreating. Their guns may still fire, but, ah, my Lord Uxbridge, you see, their armies, they are leaving. We have won the day. But still, my Lord, their artillery still fires. Here comes one now. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. By God, sir, I've lost... Stay there. <laughs> By God, sir, I've lost my leg. By God, I, I fear you have. Lord Uxbridge, sitting atop his horse, had his leg sheared off by a cannonball. It was hanging on just by thread and sinew. Lord Uxbridge was taken to a barn at Mont Saint-Jean Ridge, behind the Allied line, there to be operated on. Yes, it's pretty bad. I'm going to have to amputate. Oh, no, no, no. You can't cut my leg off. I am a well-known dancer back in London. If you cut my leg off, I won't be able to dance with the young ladies anymore. Well, you're getting old now. Maybe it's time to let some of the younger men have those dancers. All right, then. Cut off my leg. Ah, there we are. Right, there you go off to the hospital to recover. I will deal with all of these body parts that I have cut off the poor unfortunate soldiers. You see, many men get injured in battle and, uh, and I remove the parts from their bodies and then they'll be buried by a detailed crew of soldiers. I'll just leave these here and, uh, and the soldiers will come and bury those respectfully very shortly. Uh, excuse me? Oh, hello. Uh, is that a pile of legs? Yes, that's right. I've cut off some hands, legs and that sort of thing from our soldiers. I am the owner of this barn in which you did the operation. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Would you mind if I had a look through it? Um, I suppose. My name is Monsieur Paris. I'm looking for teeth to make these dentures for a rich man who will require nice teeth to replace their rotten ones. Perhaps there will be some teeth and jaws within this pile. I will have a look. Another hand, oh, a leg. Not just any leg, this is the leg of the English Lord Uxbridge, a famous Englishman who was operated on in my barn, attached to my house here at Mont Saint-Jean. I have an idea. You see, people will come. Come to see the famous battlefield at Waterloo. And I, I will bury the leg in my garden and make a small monument to it and charge people to come and see. Lord Uxbridge, you may have lost your leg, but I will gain my fortune. <laughs> the field of Waterloo was really the start of battlefield tourism. And Monsieur Paris, well, he was going to make a lot of money from it. People from all over the world, from commoners to grand people such as the Tsar of Russia, would come to see the monument to Lord Uxbridge's leg. Ah. It would make him very wealthy. I have the monument to Lord Uxbridge's leg. Here it is. Pay me money to see the monument to Lord Uxbridge's leg. Here the famous Englishman's leg is buried in my garden. Here is the monument. Ah, a man comes from England. Thirty years I have made my fortune with this leg. Ah, it would be a shame if ever I lost it. Yes, I am Lord Paget. I am the, the son of, of Lord Uxbridge who, who lost his leg and I have decided to come here and visit his leg's monument. It'll be an interesting thing for me to visit. Ah, uh, Lord Paget, it is great to have the son of the great man here. Uh, I do yes. pay your money. Uh, of course, I Thank suppose, you very yes. Much uh, now, uh, I wanted to see the monument to my father's leg. There is no monument. Well, I was told there was a grand monument sort of remembering my father in a, in a nice and in a sensitive manner. Oh, but we still remember your father. Well, how do you do that without the monument? Here are his bones. Well, hang on, that's just his leg bones. Yes, there was a storm, the monument was destroyed. We dug up the leg bones and here they are. But I don't, I didn't mind the, the, the monument, but I don't want you just like having his legs out on show. Oh, no, no, no. In the back. No, 
Everybody, no, 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 we took them legitimately when your father didn't need them anymore. We will complain in Brussels. We will ask questions of your English Parliament. Well, I happen to be a member of the English government, and I will raise this in the House, and you'll be in big trouble. Our people. Belgian politicians will write your English politicians lots of letters. We will argue about the leg for years to come. Ah. And indeed, arguments about the ownership of the bones went on for years, until the 1930s, in which a lady bought the house and all the contents. She was going to drawers, and there she found the leg bones and all the legal documentation. Ooh. She was so scared, well, she didn't want to get in any more trouble. Oh, this is a very distressing thing to find in my new house. The leg of an ancient general from a battle. Oh, oh, I don't want to deal with this. I know what I'll do. I can't be coping. I'm going to burn these so that I don't have to look at them any longer. <coughs> the lady who bought the house was so scared she'd get in more trouble. She destroyed all the paperwork and Lord Uxbridge's bones went with it. Finally, Lord Uxbridge's leg was laid to rest some years after it really should have been, it has to be said. So, I think we've nicely covered the Battle of Waterloo there, haven't we, Abs? I that's, think we have. Yes, that's covered that. We'll turn the page in the book to move on to the Victorian period in the Industrial Revolution. Now, with no French to fight, we British could really get our teeth into the Industrial Revolution. We could really set about improving our nation. We build road and railways and all sorts of rivers to help us build our world. And during that time, we really improve things with inventions. And it's brothers like the Stevensons who showed that locomotive science really is rocket science. We're going to take you now, ladies and gentlemen, with our lovely theatre to the opening of the first ever railway. The rocket is present. The Stevenson's brilliant invention. And present too, get ready to cheer, is our Prime Minister. It's Lord Wellington. Yay. Mr Huskisson is an MP, but he's upset the Duke. He doesn't want to uh, have this argument go on. So he goes forward to the Duke's carriage to introduce himself and apologise for what he has done. He's not a fit man, he's not a young man. Oh, hello there, Duke. Oh, hello, uh, nice to see you, I suppose. Uh, I'm very sorry about what happened between us. So, uh, uh, would you please forgive me for the insult that I created? Yes, of course, but you must watch out. You must get out of the way. Well, uh, I can't quite hear you, being as I am quite an elderly gentleman. Why do I need to get out of the way? You need to get out of the way for a steam locomotive is coming. Oh, it's a steam locomotive. Which way shall I go? Shall I go this way? No. Shall I go this way? Oh, no. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to get run over. <laughs> Blood spatter! Ah! 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 Screech! Alex, ah! Alex, Alex, calm down. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Huskisson was killed and he's remembered in history as the first man to be killed by a steam locomotive. There's a little monument by the side of the track to show he was the first ever casualty of a steam train accident. But the rocket was just the start. From that moment on, Britain's rise was meteoric. And under the watch of Queen Victoria, we became a world nation. We became a global power. It was our golden age. In fact, during the Victorian period, it's all great. It's all wonderful. Nothing could stain that until... We turn the page. At the turn of the 20th century, the storm clouds of war were beginning to form in Europe once again. And here we are, in the trenches. A war that will be forever remembered for its mud and filth. A war that will be remembered forever. A war fought entirely in mud. Yes, Sarge, I uh, 
I brought you a cup of tea, Sarge. Hello there, lad. There you go, Sarge. Oh, thank you, lad. You all all right? Yeah, I'm just saying this war, a war that will always be remembered, a war solely fought in the trenches and the mud. Oh, yeah, very muddy. Uh, except up in the air, Sarge. What? Well, you know, sort of, um, pilots up in aeroplanes. No mud in aeroplanes, are there? We got aeroplanes flying over in the war all the time. Yeah, well, obviously, apart from the aeroplanes, the rest of the time, this war is solely fought in mud. Yeah, you're right, Sarge, you're Obviously right. The uh, except, um, except for at sea, you know, on the ships. Yeah, well, There's no mud on ships, is there, Sarge? Well, obviously, apart from the, the, the sea, I mean, yes, I mean, that's what they say, but apart from the aeroplanes and the sea... Well, the very important, forces, the sea. Apart from that, this war is fought entirely in mud. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Sarge, except for under the sea as well, you know, them U-boats, you know, yeah. like the Germans had got under yeah, the water. Well, apart from the, the aeroplanes and the, and the sea surface vessels and the U-boats, obviously, apart from them, it's all fought in mud. It is mud and trenches, isn't it, Sarge? Uh, except in the deserts, I suppose, where it's all sand. Yeah, well, obviously, apart from the desert campaigns as well, apart from the desert campaigns and the aeroplanes and the surface vessels and the U-boats, this is a war fought entirely in the trenches. There's all that snow over in Russia as well, isn't yeah, there, Sarge? The eastern front, yeah, I mean, obviously, apart from the eastern front and the aeroplanes and the surface vessels and the submarines, apart from them, obviously, it's just fought in mud. Yeah. And then back home as well, because, like, my sister works in a munitions factory making the bullets. And there's no mud there, it's yes, all quite well, clean. Obviously, apart from all the women working at factories back at home, the surface vessels, the submarines, the aeroplanes, the desert campaign and the Russian front, this war is entirely fought in mud. Slimy, filthy, horrible, slimy mud. Except in summer, Sarge, when it's not muddy. All right, look, isn't there a cup of tea you need to be making for somebody else? All right, Everybody remembers the great... <laughs> Everybody remembers the great war, the war to end all wars. But of course, as the sand timer ticked on, and it is ticking on, everybody remembers that the great war was the big one. But of course, there was another one quickly to follow. We didn't think it would happen, but of course, if you call something the World War I, well, there's got to be a follow-up in the works. And so we turn the page to the World War II. Awful, got... awful lot of stories in the World War II. I, I tell you what, we'll start with this one. Uh, Neville Chamberlain. No, can't do that. Too... Uh, all right, I'll right. retreat to Dunkirk. Uh, we need to keep going. Uh, the Blitz, uh, people sleeping in the underground. Forty singers. Uh, uh, the Red Army. No, no, uh, no. The no, no, Turpids. No, no, there's too uh, many uh, stories of World War II. We can't do them all. No. We should focus. We're doing the history of Britain. We should do a battle in Britain or something. A battle around Britain, maybe, or... Uh, how about uh, a battle, um, battle of Britain, maybe? That would be good, yeah. Hello, Blue Leader. Patrol Gravesend, 16,000 feet. And uh, keep it on out for bandits, that's a good chap. So we are now above Gravesend in the summer of 1940. Some fighters of Fighter Command spot a load of German bombers on their way back from a raid over London. So here we see some German bombers. Can you see them, boys? They're uh, directly ahead. So it's a uh, section attack, 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 go. Make your attack, but break off the attack. I've just got close, and I realize he is, in fact, actually an unusual type. Now, us at Fighter Command have been given commands only to wing him and bring him down. So, number three, break into the attack and shoot him in the engines. Force him down for those chaps at Farnborough to have a look at him. Section attack, red leader, go, go, go. The Junkers 88 had been shot down on the marshes near Graveney Marsh, and out there in the marshes, those pilots, well, they would have abandoned their aircraft. We need to now take you to a local pub. Hello there, dearie. I'm in the sportsman near Gravesend, pulling them pipes. The army are stationed in my pub and all, so I've got a readily made supply of customers I have. 
Hello, Doris. Uh, can I have a pint of bitter and mild, please? Oh, a pint of bitter and mild. Get your laughing gear around that and no Oh, mistake. lovely. It's so nice being billeted in a pub rather than that stuffy army base. Oh, isn't it just... Oh, I need to go and change a barrel or something that publicans do. So I'm just going to go down in the cellar. Would you mind the phone for me if it rings? Oh, no problem, Doris. I'll do that. Ring, ring. That's the phone. Ring, I'd better ring. answer it. Ring, ring. Hello? Ring, ring. Hello there. Is that the sportsman pub? Oh, General! Yes, hello there. Look, a Yonkers 88's come down to Gravesend. So, uh, can you go out on the Gravy Mouse with some of your chaps and just go and uh, get the crew, will you? If they're still alive, they won't give you any trouble. So, uh, just pop over there and just take them prisoner and uh, have a look at the aircraft, see if there's anything unusual about it. There's a good chap, Toodle Pip. No problem. Thank you, General. Love you. Right, we better go out with our weapons. We've got to go and capture those German airmen. Their aircraft has been downed on the marsh. So we'll march out and we'll find them. Now, normally, in these situations, those pilots, well, they're a bit shaken up if they've survived at all, and they're more than happy to be arrested and sent off to prison where they'll be looked after for the rest of the war. So we'll go and find them wherever they might be, and then we can capture the aeroplane and we can then make it back home to the sportsman bar. Uh, ah, look, over there, I see a crashed aeroplane. Well, we'd better uh, go and investigate that, I suppose, and see what's happening with those German airmen who will be in their aircraft. Here we go. On we go, men. Here we go. Yes, right. Oh! Ah, we see the England is coming towards us. We will not give up and fight easily, for we are all alive and have taken the machine guns from our airplane. Hey, England and Tommy, put them up, Tommy! They're shooting back, but we need to uh, get them. I don't know why they would be shooting at us. Ah, we are shooting because we have a special bomb computer on board our airplane. We have set the detonation charges, but if they get to us too quickly, they will capture the bomb computer before the detonators go off. We will hold them off until the airplane is destroyed. Take that, Tommy! Uh, uh. Right, I've had enough of this. It's time we fought back. Uh. Uh. Oh, he has shot me in the boot. Yes, are you gonna surrender now? Oh, 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 all right, we surrender. Uh, uh, uh. I hope they do not find the bomb computer. Right, well, why are you so keen to, to keep us from here? Hey, what's this then? Hey, Fritz, what's that? Oh, no, they have found the explosive charges and they will disable them. Oh, hang on, it's making a funny ticking noise. I'm just going to shove this in a ditch, I think. Oh, Cassius, right. they have found our technology and for me, the war is over. Don't worry, Fritz, it's not all bad. We'll take you back to the pub. Doris will have changed the barrel by now. Oh. I will go back to your English pub and drink warm lager beer. That's right. You, you can't even hope to win the war, Fritz. Oh, yeah. You may be right. But well, now I am a prisoner. But I will give myself the comfort of knowing we will beat you in subsequent penalty shootouts forevermore. <laughs> Goodbye. So... World War II has many stories. We can't cover them all because we're only looking at Britain. So it's time, really. Oh, Alex, to move quick, on. Quick, quick. Ah, right. Well, we've pretty much done it. The end of World War II, and we come through to modern day. Obviously, history continues even after the Second World War with things like the Beatles, the World Cup, or even Tim Berners-Lee inventing the internet. But of course. There are other heroes post-war to remember. And let us not forget those brave Englishmen that robbed the Milan National Bank with only a series of Mini Coopers, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, and they were only supposed to blow the doors off. We also commemorate that doctor, that, that doctor who battled day and night to defeat the Crinoids, the Cybermen, and the Daleks. Yes, he exterminated them from England's shores. And then, of course, ladies and gentlemen, who can forget those brave Bristolian heroes that went to the moon to retrieve cheese in a rocket made of plasticine, a crew entirely composed of a man and his dog. It is heroes like this that we 
absolute. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been the history tellers. Thank you. Yeah.